if you'll join me for a word of prayer and then we'll get started. Father, t'was grace that taught my heart to fear and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed. Such a beautiful song and it just expresses so well the reality of your grace. I pray now that you would grant me your grace as I speak to these men and that your spirit would be with all of us tonight as we hear your word. I pray this in all in your name. Amen. In the seventh chapter of Daniel, the prophet is given quite an amazing vision. He sees four vicious beasts coming and devouring their victims one after the other. And we know from later in the chapter exactly what these beasts represent. The four beasts represent four kingdoms that will have rule over the nation of Israel. The first beast is the Babylonian Empire. Babylon was where the nation of Israel was currently in captivity at the time of Daniel. The following beasts represent the empires of Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome which brings us right up to New Testament times. But I want to point out that in this vision, there are not four empires pictured, but five. And like the previous four, the fifth empire will also have a figure to represent it. But it will not be a beast. Let me read what it says in Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 through 14. In my vision at night, I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the ancient of days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every language worshiped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. I'm calling this lecture, The Empire of the Son of Man. I have two divisions. My first division is titled, The Son of Man's Authority Over Sin, and it covers Matthew chapter 9, verses 1 through 17. Open your Bible with me and join me in Matthew chapter 9. If you remember from last week, Jesus has just left a dramatic incident across the Sea of Galilee that led to 2,000 pigs running into the sea. Well, now he is back in Capernaum, and the crowds come right back, and there will be yet another dramatic scene. In verse 2, it tells us that some men brought Jesus a paralytic lying on a mat, and it says, when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the man, take heart, son, your sins are forgiven. If you wonder how it is that Jesus saw their faith, the Gospel of Mark makes that explicitly clear. Mark tells us that they were so de desperate to get to Jesus that they tore the roof apart and lowered him down through it. Matthew doesn't focus on that, but instead focuses on Jesus' response. Jesus tells the man that his sins are forgiven. Now, I would think that if I was a paralytic and I came to Jesus, there's a good possibility that I would want him to heal me and that I might find all this forgiveness talk somewhat patronizing. But that's a modern Western sentiment. We tend to place a dichotomy between our physical, mental, and emotional and spiritual states. But to the Jewish mind, they were all connected. There was no separation. If you recall the book of Job, he suffers beyond imagination, but it has nothing to do with his sin. The Bible explicitly tells us that, and it tells us that he was a righteous man. But what do Job's friends say when they come to him? They constantly reiterate that he is in his present condition because of unrepentant sin in his life. But that wasn't true at all. But the common teaching of Jesus' day was very similar to that of Job's friends. So they looked down at the people with diseases and ailments because they believed that they were suffering for sins that they had committed. So it is not unthinkable that though this man was paralyzed, he recognized what his real need was. 
forgiveness of his sins. And that is what Jesus gives him here, seeing the faith of he and those that brought him. The man did nothing to earn this forgiveness. How can he? He's paralyzed. What is he supposed to do? But that doesn't matter. The scripture tells us in Ephesians 2 that it is by the grace of God that we have been saved through faith. And this is not of ourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. And so Jesus, seeing this man's faith, forgives him. This causes quite a stir among the teachers of the law. But who are these guys? They were the theologians of ancient Israel. And their job was to systematize the theology, to make it all work right. They sorted everything out. They were the great scholars of their day. And they raised an objection. They say that Jesus is blaspheming because no one can forgive sins but God alone. The issue they are raising is one of authority, which is a common refrain with them in this gospel. If you recall from the end of the Sermon on the Mount, it says there that the people marveled at Jesus because he spoke as one having authority and not as the teachers of the law. And that's the same issue here. What authority does Jesus have to forgive sins? They see this as something only God can do. And you know something? They are absolutely correct. No one can forgive sins but God alone. But the reader of the Gospel of Matthew knows something from as far back as chapter 1, that Jesus is no mere man, but Emmanuel, God with us. And he came to save his people from their sins. So Jesus, just as he confronted their misunderstanding of the law in the Sermon on the Mount, will now challenge their misunderstanding of him here. First, he addresses their thoughts, which is a dead giveaway. Jeremiah 17.10 tells us that God is the one who searches the hearts. And then he asks them an interesting question. Which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up and walk? The reality is that neither of us, none of us can say either of those things. We can't make a paralyzed man walk or forgive someone's sins. Both of those things are things only God can do. But it is much easier to say that someone's sins are forgiven because it's not immediately verifiable. How are you supposed to prove that that's true or false? So Jesus will now give verification to his claim because if he tells this man to get up and walk and nothing happens, he will be proven to be a fraud but so that they may know that the Son of Man has the authority to forgive sins, he tells the man to get up and walk, and he does it. Just as the pigs throwing themselves into the water proved the authenticity of the miracle in the previous chapter, so does this miracle verify the claim of Jesus to forgive sins. But beyond that, Jesus identifies himself as the Son of Man, the ruler of the final empire referred to in Daniel chapter 7 as I mentioned in the introduction. The message of both he and John the Baptist has been repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near. And now we see him using the language of Daniel to refer to himself as the ruler of that empire. Will the people of God accept their king? Now, a natural question arises at this point. How far does this forgiveness of sin go? And for that, we are given the account of the calling of Matthew, who was a tax collector. The Jews believed that the tax collectors were the worst sinners. Do you know why that is? They were Jewish people who had gone to the Roman Empire to purchase a tax franchise from them. The Roman government took a cut of their profits but beyond that, they were free to collect whatever they could from whoever they could. As a result, they behaved like thieves, robbing from those around them. And as such, 
the Jews regarded them as traitors to the kingdom of God. Betraying their own people for money. You know something? They were absolutely right about that too. Jesus even taught in the Sermon on the Mount that tax collectors were evil. And the Jews taught that because of this betrayal, tax collectors were beyond salvation, outside of the kingdom of God. Matthew had sold his soul to the Roman Empire for money, but the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost. After all, isn't that the condition of all of us? Doesn't Ephesians 2 tell us that we were all dead in our transgressions and sins, gratifying the desires and thoughts of our flesh, being by nature deserving of wrath? But God, who is rich in mercy, has made us alive in him, even though we were dead in our transgressions, because it is by grace that we have been saved. Well, we know the story, and we've seen it before. Matthew gets up and follows Jesus. But this is different than before. Peter and Andrew and James and John left their fishing trade and followed Jesus. But have you noticed that there's still a boat that's ferrying them around the lake? Or that there's still a house that they retreat to that's inhabited by Peter's mother-in-law? See, the fish weren't going anywhere. These other disciples could go back to fishing anytime they wanted to. And in fact, they do in John chapter 21. And Jesus has to go and get them. But that's not the case with Matthew. I guarantee you that Rome had that tax booth filled the next day. When Matthew got up, he could never go back. His old life was over. And he knew it. And he did it anyway. And then he threw a party and invited all of his friends who would have been other tax collectors and those they associated with, such as prostitutes and thugs. But isn't this something similar to something we've seen before too? Didn't Jesus say last chapter that many would come from east and west and take their seats with the patriarch in the kingdom of heaven, but that the sons of the kingdom would be thrown into outer darkness? What do we see in this picture here? A bunch of undesirable people having a banquet with Jesus. While the religious leaders stand outside, refusing to come in griping about what they see before them. Is this a preview of what Jesus was speaking of there? Is this what the kingdom of God will look like? Well, the Pharisees complained to the disciples, and Jesus responds to that complaint in verses 12 and 13. And he quotes Hosea 6, verse 6. I want to turn to Hosea 6 because I think the context is helpful and I'm going to bring it up on the screen for you here. Look at how this starts. Come, let us return to the Lord. He will hear us, heal us. It talks about him binding up their wounds. This is wonderful. There's a revival in Israel. It's great. Isn't it? But what's going on with God's response in verse 4? Let me give you some background on the book of Hosea. In the book, God is presenting Israel as an unfaithful wife, a wife that has become a prostitute and is sleeping with other gods. Sure, they're still worshiping the true God, but they're also worshiping false gods on the side. So let's look at what they say in verse, continue to look at this. What they say in verse three, let us acknowledge the Lord. Let us press on to acknowledge him. As surely as the sun rises, he will appear. God is like the sunrise. He's always there in the morning, always there, consistent. 
And they depended on the winter and spring rains to water their crops for harvest. And they were very reliable and they brought blessing when they came. They say, God is like that. He's always there. He's consistent. He's always gracious and forgiving. He's always there. Well, God responds to them in verse four. If they think he is like the rising sun and these reliable rains, they are like the morning dew. God says to them, just like the morning dew, you are there in the morning when people first start to get up. But where are you after a couple of hours? You're gone. See, it's true that God is gracious and forgiving and good. But they were not faithful. These people were not reliable. They came in and offered their offerings to God. And when they were done, you could find them at a shrine for another deity down the street. Do we ever do that? Giving God his hour on Sunday morning and then run off to live the rest of our week as if nothing had happened? Well, God says, I desire mercy and not sacrifice. We see again, just like in the Sermon on the Mount, God is not interested in ceremony and ritual and outward religious expression, but in the changing of the heart. You see, God is gracious and forgiving, and that is true. But that grace is not to be presumed upon. They were like those who say today, oh, God is so wonderful. I can do whatever I want, and he will heal me. Forgive me. But it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. You see, in Titus 2, verse 11 through 14, it tells us that the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation and teaching us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live godly lives. God does not merely forgive our sins by his grace. He also, by his grace, makes us into a new creation and changes our hearts. God is pointing out to these people in the Old Testament that they claim to be his people and worship him, but their hearts are not right. And Jesus tells the Pharisees in our text that they have the same problem. See, so he tells them that he has not, they have, he tells them that they have the rituals and the regulations down pat, but their hearts are not right before him. So he tells them that he has not come for the people who think they're all right, but for those who know that they are not. See, the Pharisees claim to know God, but inside they were rotten. Jesus will say later in the Gospel of Matthew that they were full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. But on the other hand, Matthew was rotten. But when Jesus came, his life changed, and he authored a gospel. Because when God truly changes a life, that life is never the same again. Well, the disciples of John the Baptist come to him in verse 14, and they're hung up on the rituals too. This is so sad. Did you notice that they're still disciples of John? Even after John the Baptist himself has pointed to Jesus and told them that he's the one they should follow. And we see again that they're all about these rituals of fasting. But what was the point of fasting in the Old Testament? It was connected with mourning and seeking after God. But that wasn't what, was, what it was about anymore. The Pharisees fasted twice a week. This was just, wasn't about seeking God with a contrite heart. This was just something that they did. A ritual. But Jesus is gracious toward them. In chapter 3 of John, John the Baptist tells the same group of disciples that he must decrease and Jesus must increase. And then he compares himself to the best man of a bridegroom who is just happy to be there and see the joy of his friend. Jesus now uses the same imagery for himself, picking up on what their teacher himself had taught them. Guys, I'm the bridegroom. Follow me. 
Your rituals are inappropriate right now. This is not the time for mourning. The king is here. The kingdom has come. And he uses the imagery of wineskin and patched clothing. Patched clothing. His point is this. He did not come to patch the ritualistic system of apostasy that the Pharisees had developed. He did not come to reform Pharisaic rabbinic Judaism. He came to fulfill true Old Testament Judaism. The law and the prophets to circumcise not their flesh, but their hearts. What about you? Where is your heart? You clearly come to Bible study on Monday nights, but where are you the rest of the week? Are you truly worshiping God from the heart? Or are you paying him lip service and thinking that that's all right? Presuming upon his gracious nature. But maybe that's not you. If so, great. But are you witnessing to all people, regardless of what they say and do? Or are you, are you calling the worst of sinners to repentance? Or are you just witnessing to those who look like they're pretty okay? My principle is this. The Son of Man calls for a changed heart. The Son of Man calls for a changed heart. My second division is titled, The Son of Man Has Authority Over Physical Ailments. And it covers the remainder of our section down to verse 34. Well, the banquet is interrupted in verse 18 when a ruler of the synagogue comes to him because his daughter has died. Now, this text doesn't point it out explicitly, but we again see the faith of this man, just as we saw the faith of the paralytic in, the pre, in, in his friends earlier in the chapter. Most of us would not go down to get the pastor down the street if someone around us died. To raise them up because we know that they can't do it but this man believed that jesus could and he acts upon that faith by the way this is another biblical principle faith manifests itself in actions and this goes back to the imagery of a tree bearing fruit that we've already seen in the gospel of matthew true faith always manifests itself in the life of a believer and it does so here this man acts upon that faith and comes to Jesus, and his faith is rewarded. We see in verse 25 that Jesus is able to do this, and this is a great reality because it points to the day when, according to John 5, all the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and live because God has given him authority to execute judgment because he is the Son of Man. Now, backing up to verse 20, to examine the interruption that occurred upon their journey when the woman of the issue with the issue of bleeding comes to Jesus. You can use your imagination to figure out where this bleeding was coming from, but I want you to put yourself in this woman's shoes for a moment. Imagine that you have been hemorrhaging blood for quite some time. And now, in addition, imagine that you are unable to worship God because of it. Why? Well, Leviticus lays out for us that a woman is unclean during her period of menstrual impurity. This is because blood symbolizes life. And when blood is lost or shed, it is symbolic of death. As Leviticus says, the life of the flesh is in the blood. Just as an aside, uncleanness does not necessarily denote sin. They are separate things. But uncleanness is meant to point to sin in that what is unclean cannot approach what is clean, just as sin separates us from God. So back to our imagination. You have this issue of hemorrhaging, and you are unable to worship God. And you are like, because of that, you likely believe that you are under his judgment and beyond salvation. Now imagine that you have no family and no friends. Because you are permanently unclean. 
you would just be passing your uncleanness off to them. You are basically a leper, but it's worse than that. At least lepers can hang out with other lepers. You have no one. And now imagine that this has been your life for 12 years. That's 2009. Where were you in 2009? Was your oldest child born? Was your youngest child born? Were you married? I've been married for going on eight years and have two children. I hadn't even met my wife 12 years ago. How desperate would you be? Well, we see her coming to Jesus in faith as well, though her faith is a bit superstitious. She believes that if she just touches the tassels of his robe, she will be healed. And that's exactly what happens. In Mark, it tells us that when Christ addressed her, she came in fear and trembling before him. Why? Because she, before she believed that she could be healed if she touched him. But now she knows that she has been healed. And she has been touching everyone around her to try to get to him. Passing her uncleanness off to all of them. And more than that, she has now defiled the very person who healed her. Right? The unclean thing has come into contact, not with that which was clean, but with that which was holy. There was a penalty for that. But Jesus merely calls her daughter, just as he called the paralytic son. And then he uses the normal Greek word for salvation when he says to her, your faith has saved you. Who is this man that when he touches the unclean thing, he makes it clean? That rather than participating in sin with sinners when he eats for, with them, makes them holy. We see the answer when the blind men come and address him as the son of David. That's who he is, the Messiah, the King, the Son of Man. But can I tell you something? Never, no healing, there was no healing of a blind man ever in the Old Testament. In John 9, it tells us that explicitly. Never in the history of the world has anyone ever opened the eyes of a man born blind. But Jesus tells us exactly what is going on in Matthew 12, verse 28. He says, if I cast out demons by the spirit of God, then you know that the kingdom of God has come upon you. What does Isaiah 35 say will happen in the kingdom age? Then the eyes of the blind will be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. We see that here. The lame, then the lame will leap like a deer and the mute tongue shout for joy. We saw a lame man walk in this very chapter. Do you know what is happening here? The heavenly empire of God is invading the kingdom of the world. The king has come. And yet our section closes on a sour note. The people attribute the kingdom of God, not to God, but to Satan. The blind men could see what the Pharisees could not. We know how this story ends. What a tragedy. The kingdom of God is rejected and spurned. But we know that that's not the end of the story. In Philippians 2, it says that God has now exalted him, meaning Jesus, to the highest place and giving him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. He was rejected the first time, but next time 
That is not how it's going to go down. The empire of the Son of Man will be established on earth as it is in heaven. The end of Matthew's gospel, Jesus will declare that all authority on heaven and on earth has been given to him. Therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. Christians, you have been given your commission. You are soldiers and you have received your marching orders. The empire of God has invaded the kingdom of this world. And you must choose which empire you will fight for. Choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord, the Son of God and Son of Man. My principle is this. The Son of Man has all authority on heaven and on earth. The Son of Man has all authority in heaven and on earth. Gentlemen, if you would pray with me. Master, we thank you for your wonderful gift of grace that you have saved us by your grace, not on the basis of things we had done, but on your basis of your own unfailing love. May we serve you in whatever capacity you wish. And that you give us the grace to do just that. And help us fulfill the commission that you have granted to us. I pray this all in your name. Amen.